and those who have vision for children as well. Second point is noticing and exploration. You know that there's no way you learn something until you notice it. And you know the idea of noticing in language teaching, yes? Are you familiar with that? Noticing means being aware of it, paying conscious attention to something. So unless you learn to do it, you'll never become a, a successful and autonomous learner. All right? So for that, um, I train students in observing uh, the input they get, in learning how to support collocations from the texts, from the readings, from the listenings, and also how to identify them uh, using concordances, right corpus days. Sorry, purpose-based um, um, I don't know if you're familiar with purpose-based methodology, with purpose-based teaching, or for the with the use of corpora for language teaching. But just to give you um, the main point of the main reasons why I believe in it so much, uh, from the linguistic side, from the linguistic point of view, and. Um, and some of the main advantages in using concordances and corpora for the for location teaching is that they you can see them in context, which means you not only get access to the semantic value or the meaning of collocations, which is something you can get from dictionaries, but also to syntactical and pragmatical and connotational uh, nuances um, out of the context, all right, which is a very good point when you're learning vocabulary, all right, particularly at an advanced level. Then, um, patterns are made salient by concordances because you, you read, you know, in corpus data, you don't read horizontally, you read vertically, and the um, display in the screen, in the computer screen, makes you um, realize just at first sight what the frequent patterns uh, in the language are. So it's very visual and very um, uh, easy to understand for learners. All right, and also. And this is something I always like to, to, to use with my students. Um, collocation, sorry. Concordances do not only give you information about what does exist in the language, but also about what does not exist in the language. Because if I ask my students to search for something and they cannot find it, it just means, maybe it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but it means natives don't use it very often, all right? Which is important to know. As users of a non um, of a second language. Sorry. And from the pedagogical perspective, uh, and then because you're studying pedagogy and you are um, experts in the field, if I if I say the word constructivism, you know what I mean? Yes? Yes you do? So there's nothing more constructivist than corpus based language teaching because it's you, the learner, the one who looks at the concordances the one who creates their, their, um, your own hypothesis and you put your own hy hy hypothesis to the test. So this is learning through real discovery, all right? which means deep mental processing and therefore hopefully long-term retention. All right? So there's a lot of um, rational behind the use of purpose-based methodologies in language teaching, particularly in collocation teaching. These are just some of the examples. I give students texts for them to notice, to pay attention to collocations and to identify them, all right, to learn how to um, become autonomous learners, or I give them sentences and with the help of corpus-based material, they need to correct wrong collocations, translate them, give better options for um, wrong combinations of words, and so on, all right? These are just some of the activities. For number three, well, you know, uh, in vocabulary teaching, uh, it is essential um, to uh, get a number of encounters with a word in order to memorize it. Well, it depends on the word, on the word. because there are some words uh, that you just remember for the first time you see it, such as fuck, for instance. There's no need for 17 encounters with the word. The first time you, you encounter it, you'll remember it. So uh, it depends on the word. But usually, you need at least five, six, or even 10 encounters with word in order to remember them. And uh, if this is the case for isolated words, more, uh, it is more the case um, with um, collocations because they are more difficult to learn, all right? So um, for that reason, um, I tend to create um, activities with um, 
potatoes. Are you familiar with hot potatoes? Yes. yes. So I create activities with them which are automatically corrected by the machine and um, where students can uh, work with different collocations once and again so that there's no mistake. And finally, production of collocations. And the idea here is not just to make students use, well, you know that after input, you need to promote output, all right? But the idea is not only to make our students use the collocations they have been learning. That is far too simple, and that does not lead to real autonomous learning. For autonomous learning to take place, you need to be able to generate your own new searches and your own new collocations, all right? Uh, which means that I ask students, again, for the sake of autonomy or autonomous learning, I ask students to find the collocations they need in English uh, by themselves beyond the ones they've been learning along the uh, model. All right? So um, basically the idea is, again, to teach students to fish, not just to, um, to eat fish. <laughs> All right? Um, and for doing that, I uh, give them different resources, concordances, such as Sara, which is based on the bank on the British National Carpus, and also Pi, which is not a Pi, it's phrases in English, um, which is another program, right? Which is a concordance. Um, these are some of the, these are, um, this is Pi, this is phrases in English, one of the um, concordances uh, created in the United States. And these are some of the activities I ask them to. Uh, to, uh, to, do, um, to, to use um, their own collocations, to find them, and then to use them, all right? Um, well, I know um, I'm running out of time, is it? Do I have to finish? All right, because um, the rest of it is just um, checking uh, empirically whether all these treatment, all these activities really work whether they actually help my students uh, to learn or not. So for that, I just did um, this actual research, some study, where I collected quantitative data and uh, qualitative data. For the quantitative data, I conducted a pre-test cross-test protocol with seven mini-tests, all right? Three of them receptive knowledge of collocations, the, the, the following four productive knowledge of collocations, all right? So I checked their knowledge before doing these exercises and these, um, this program and after doing it to compare the results, all right? And then for the qualitative uh, data, I just gave them a question uh, uh, with some answers, uh, with some questions that they asked, all right? And um, I'm going to give you some results very quickly. Basically, pre-test, post-test. Obviously, there was improvement, all right? And if you compare the results in the seven mini-tests, you see there was improvement in all of them, all right? The thing is, well, I don't know if you're familiar with the statistics at all. I'm not going to bore you with this. I just need to say that for real statistics to be good, this is not enough. I mean, this is just my subjective appreciation of the results. I can say there was improvement. The thing is, was this improvement likely to be um, due to chance? Or is there a real reason for saying that these differences between the pre-tests and the post-tests uh, were, uh, were due to my teaching, all right? So, well, for that, you conducted this a t-test, all right, a comparison of mix, um, with a lot of information. Uh, we, didn't get, we didn't get significant difference in tests number three and number seven, and if you're interested, I can explain to you later on why I think this was the case. But the important thing is that the very last one, which is the general comparison between the pre-test and the post-test, was perfect. Zero is the perfect, um, the perfect value that we expect. All right. If we have this zero on the bottom, it means the difference between the pre-test and the post-test is due, with all probability, to my teaching and not to chance. All right. So I can say there was statistical significant difference between pre-test and post-test, all right? Um, and then as to qualitative results, I gave them a questionnaire with a good number of questions. I'm not going to give you the answers to all questions, but just I selected three of them. Um, will concordances on corpus-based teaching or learning be helpful, helpful for you in your future learning? 
you see most of them said, most of my students said very often, and some of them in certain subjects, all right? I also asked them whether um, they will make them, they will make them um, much more autonomous or more autonomous, all right, which is half and half. And finally, well, you can't read the question. It was, uh, you found this module, this teaching program, very useful, quite useful, and then some of them little useful, all right? So I think it was quite popular, quite successful for them from their own uh, subjective perspective, which is also important. All right? So can I say, can I confirm my hypothesis? Well, initially, potentially, with this little experience, I think yes. Again, only tentative um, answers because there's only um, the first, the initial um, step in the research, all right? So, conclusions. Collocations are important, but they are very badly taught. So please, you future teachers, do something, all right, with your students. <coughs> Proposed corpus-based framework. I think uh, you need to select very carefully the collocations you want to teach to your students. And I selected the frequent collocations in the way you saw. Uh, I designed the online, the online activities to raise learners' awareness, to make them notice collocations, also um, to promote productive, real autonomous use of new collocations, and um, I give them um, tools for real autonomous learning. My preliminary results are satisfactory, all right? Uh, and for the future, I want to enlarge the list of collocations. To me, 2,688 are not enough, so I want more. Um, uh, I want to explore oral collocations, because, uh, and particularly oral teaching of collocations, because this is all written. This was an online course, so we were mainly working on the written side of the language. I would like to explore uh, oral use of collocations in the activities. Um, this is an idea that I have, but it's very difficult to, to, to actually implement, which is using errors made by real students as a source of information to create new activities, all right? And uh, I need to keep researching, checking whether this actually works with more students or it's only with me, with my students, uh, or what, what the situation is. And this is my huge thank you. Uh, to all of you for your patience and your kind of We would like to thank Professor Kain for her talk. Let me remind you that if you have any questions about her presentation or the other presenters, save them until the plenary session. Um, now may I briefly introduce to you all our next guest speaker from the Southern Federal University in Russia, Julia Privalova. Her educational background includes a specialist degree in EFL teaching from Tangarok State Teachers Training Institute and a candidate of pedagogy degree from Tambov State University. Her career began in 1999, where she started teaching EFL at Tangarok State University of Radio Engineering, now Southern Federal University. Since then, she's been with the Department of Linguistics, where she became the head of department in 2010. In 2007, she was awarded with an academic status. Professor Privalova's primary research interests focus on procedural negotiations in language education and teaching translation as a type of cross-cultural speech communication. She holds membership in the European Association for Language Testing and Assessment. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Professor Julia Privalova. Good afternoon and buenas tardes. In Russia, we say Dobry Din. Dobry Din to you. So I'm going to, like, it seems to me that I'm going to continue talking about the process syllabus that uh, Patricia started talking about. And I'm going to speak about the experience we have in Russia. 
so that's the topic of my talk. And uh, you know, nowadays in Russia, we try to redefine and review the roles of the teacher and the students in the classroom, and the ability to guide oneself through their own education with the help of a flexible and highly individualized trajectory is viewed as one of the most important components of modern academic environment in Russia. Individualization of one's educational pathway implies that the students should be capable of making conscious and independent choices that comprise their educational trajectory. These choices may concern the curriculum as a whole as well as modules of separate disciplines. We believe that this should eventually enable the student to regulate the intensity of his or her learning, to perform more efficient and independent work on educational material, as well as foster a more conscientious attitude towards education and life in general. Practical realization of individualized educational paths requires that essential changes be introduced into the educational process, both at the stage of its planning and at the stage of implementation. One of the most novel of these changes includes the delegation of a certain uh, set of rights to students, granting them educational autonomy in building their own individual program of autonomous personality. Literature on language teaching is pierced with countless definitions of autonomy. From this, we can assume that autonomy does not only mean freedom of action, but also constitutes a broader notion that includes the idea that a person accepts responsibility for the course of his own life, which in its turn presumes that autonomy must be reached and maintained throughout one's life. Experiments in the sphere of learning autonomy specify that the process of fostering autonomy in language education can be successful if it derives from both students' and teachers' motivations. Success of innovative experience, experiments in education um, is defined by the ability of educational institutions to respond quickly to the changes in the environment that translates into high and steady demand for its graduates and their competitiveness at the labor market. The term innovation in the sphere of education means changes in and transformation of curricula and educational technology with a view to increasing their efficiency. One of the types of the innovations used in the educational process in Russia that we would like to focus on is negotiation. And you have got the definition of negotiation in the sphere of in everyday speech. In the educational process, the target of negotiation is to achieve compromise by getting students to participate in the educational process. Negotiation can also serve as a basis of a process syllabus. Process syllables differs from traditional content-centered syllables that it considers intra-group decisions as potential negotiations during which the teacher and the students have an opportunity to create and devise their own syllables for their own group. Negotiations can be a means for teachers and students to achieve consent in four key areas of decision-making process. No decision can be reached without the influence of other decisions which are made, which have already been made or which will be made in future. Negotiations being part of a cycle are means for teachers and students to become creators of the lesson, to show their own idea of the lesson and to create the basis for decision making in future. Negotiation cycle with the process syllables can be represented as three important stages, discussions, actions and assessment. But as Patricia has already said, uh, these stages can, uh, should not follow each other or they cannot follow each other. They can be replaced uh, and uh, you can return back to the previous stage when you feel it's necessary. During stage one, the teacher and students identify and discuss a number of questions relating to organization of their study process. They also identify the most pressing issues concerning, for example, those which cause difficulties both for the teacher and the student. Students. Stage two is the productive action stage, where actions are taken to address the issues identified during stage one. At this stage, students make choices about which problem to work on, or what topics should receive more the attention, or how their work could be organized. 
An example of such choice could be the student's decision to do a certain task together in the classroom, but in the absence of the teacher. Students are also entitled to make choices about their assessment. They can set assessment criteria, dependently create a suitable test or a test task, or choose appropriate test tasks from a test bank. They may prefer to create a portfolio or write a report to assess their own strengths and their weak points. The most important parameter of process syllabus is probably that it's based on the estimation of the made decisions or several decisions. Defining student reaction is a key contribution to the process or to the educational process. At stage three, we estimate students from the point of view of what was acquired and what was difficult, and expediency or inexpediency of the plan of actions which they followed on the basis of the made decisions at the very beginning and further. In the traditional system of education, control is one of the main sources of information on how educational process proceeds. In procedural technology, students and teachers share responsibility for educational process that stimulates students into understanding that the purpose of assessment is to get information concerning the educational process, but not discriminations between those who can and those who cannot. Students appreciate the chance of communication with a teacher who stops being just a tutor and becomes their partner. Students feel that their individuality is paid attention to and their achievements, problems and desires do not remain unnoticed. Besides, students get accustomed to diagnosing their own shortcomings and problems and to working on their elimination. Students can also participate in decision-making concerning components that must be included in the assessment and the relative weight of each aspect of teacher and self-assessment that we believe improves the relationship between teacher and students. Exact self-assessment indicates that learning autonomy works well. Nevertheless, teacher is still authoritative and it means that proposals of students concerning assessment must be accepted and approved by him. When students reach agreement between themselves, they should come to an agreement with their teacher. As a rule, assessment is the most difficult challenge for the teacher who frequently becomes the reason of student anger. When students participate in assessment, they can experience difficulties more deeply. At the same time, teacher learns how students assess themselves as learners. They can share responsibility for this, for this or that decision with other students. One of the main advantages of negotiation is that it gives an excellent opportunity to assess not only students' performance, but also the course as a whole. While discussing the components of the course with the student, the teacher becomes aware of the possible discrepancies between what has been studied and what was initially planned to be studied. If it happens during the course, there is time to introduce changes to the process of education and to modify the course depending on the set goals. Sometimes the participants of negotiation may have every reason to change the very goal of studying a discipline if it does not meet the students' needs. Students receive response concerning their academic achievements not only for the purpose of assessment, but also to help them to progress faster. Nevertheless, there are certain difficulties connected with procedural assessment. First of all, it takes a lot of time. This process takes about three or four hours if to do everything carefully. In general, such consumption of time can be considered to be a problem, especially when there is a lot to study. The second difficulty is that not all students are ready to take responsibility, and not all teachers are strong and courageous enough to share it. Many students do not want to do teacher's job and prefer to reflect on their own and not to reflect on their own achievements. It's difficult for the teacher who has a clear view of his role in the classroom to accept the idea that students have the right to take part in the assessment discussion. When process syllabus is put into practice, it becomes clear that there cannot be certain finally made or standard process syllabus. There is only a number of various options of syllabus development. So to verify the effectiveness of the procedural technology for innovative autonomous language education based on negotiations uh, that we are offering and to confirm the validity of our basic theoretical propositions, we staged an education experiment at Southern Federal University of Russia. Experiment was necessitated by a variety of reasons, including habitual ignoring of such personal qualities of students as criticism, 
creativity, aspiration of self-development does not increase students' motivation that results in slow development of student individuality. Education of students with various needs using a uniform, strictly set syllabus does not enable students to participate in determination of the aims and uh, contents of their education they feel is necessary for their personality, and does not promote realization of student-centered approach, which was originally designed to provide students with steady and flexible trajectories of life. Prevalence of educational methods that focus on passing down pre-cooked knowledge and ready-made recipes of solving original problems builds a false conviction in students that any problem has only one correct answer rather than a set of various alternative solutions. Ignoring the importance of students' personal autonomy in the course of education leads to the situation where they simply react to teacher-induced stimuli instead of taking an active position, generating ideas and taking opportunities. Such situation further results in students' inability to assume an active and competitive role in the job market. The experiment lasted for three years from 2010 to 2013 and uh, we stated within the framework of four academic subjects toward the Department of Linguistics. To organize the educational experiment, it was necessary to introduce students to the idea of procedural technology of innovative autonomous language education based on negotiation, to evaluate the level of development of the set of professional competencies on the studied courses at the beginning of the experiment, to provide students with relevant materials like dictionaries, handouts, etc., and to re-equip the room so that it could be comfortable for studying. That was quite difficult. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. To practically implement negotiation in the classroom, we found it important to establish an atmosphere of cooperation between teacher and students, to create and support the atmosphere of creativity and confidential relationship within the student group by promoting the use of formula of politeness, relaxation and encouragement, to create and support the feeling of student confidence in the achievement of educational aims, to create favorable conditions for the development of intellectual and creative potential of each student and to create conditions for flexible, individualized learning paths of every student. 132 students from 13 academic groups participated in the experiment. The experiment was of the so-called vertical type, as we compared the development of students' professional competencies at the beginning and at the end of the experiment. We considered students' result as the criterion of efficiency of educational problem progresses. Uh, results our students showed were considered both in subjective and in objective aspects. The objective aspect is seen as qualitative change in the development of the set of professional competencies in comparison with the initial level that finds expression in quantitative increase of learning coefficient. Points received at the entrance evaluation procedure are regarded as a basic value of success. In this work, the learning coefficient is viewed as a measurement unit for the develop level of development of professional competencies. To calculate the coefficient of improvement, it was necessary to determine the average learning coefficient for every group chosen to take part in the experiment. This was done through a test at the beginning of the experiment, but uh, this was done just for the sake of the experiment because we know that negotiation implies that students can choose themselves the way they are going to be assessed and evaluated, and I introduced this test just for the sake of the experiment. Uh, so there were two tests, one at the beginning of the experiment and another one at the end of the experiment. Then it was necessary to find the differential between average coefficient of test 2 and 1 to average coefficient of test 1 expressed in percent. average learning coefficient of test 1, we had to calculate learning coefficient of every student. In Russia, assessment is carried out using a 5-mark rating system, where 5 corresponds to an excellent mark, 4 is a good mark, 3 equals to a satisfactory mark, while 2 and 1 correspond to an unsatisfactory mark. So we calculated test 1 mark of every student. Some results of test 1 are presented in table 1. So you can see that um, out of 132 students, only two students showed excellent results in the first test. And one student uh, just uh, had on about uh, 14 correct answers.
Thus, the average mark of test one was three point. Mm -hmm. 3.413. We analyzed the range of changes in the level of study knowledge of students in groups. This value was determined by the value of standard deviation. Standard deviation shows measure of dispersion of marks. Just a second. Uh -huh. uh, in groups in relation to the average mark that can also be considered as the accuracy of characteristic of student knowledge. The results of calculations shown at the beginning of the experiment were as follows. These data proved that the students had not yet developed set of professional competencies. Students whose role was reduced to a passive assimilation of knowledge lacking initiative perceived themselves as objects of the teacher efforts or mere executors of the teacher's plans and intentions, thus seeing not much sense in studying. Proceeding from the above, we drew a conclusion that students do not perceive themselves as subjects of the educational activity, capable to make crucial decisions concerning their education, to initiate activity and to operate it, to self-study uninterruptedly. We believe that leads, that leads to insufficient level of development of the set of professional competencies and is further reflected in the low levels of graduates' competitiveness. During the experiment, we focused on creating a favorable atmosphere for studying, self-expression, and self-development. All students had an opportunity to present his or her own vision of educational process, and all of those were later discussed in detail. Students were continually encouraged to be actively involved in the process of grasping and mastering the studied material. With the teacher's help, every student had an opportunity to choose their own independent path of study, which allowed to increase motivation and to intensify creativity as well as promote development and improvement of the ability to find optimal solutions for specific problems and to implement them. The final assessment task was used to define the level of development of the set of professional competencies at the end of the experiment. The method of calculating key parameters did not differ from the stated above for test 1. The summary results of test 2 are presented in table 2. The results of calculations of average learning coefficient, average mark and value of standard deviation of test 1 and 2 are displayed in these bar graphs. Bar graph 1 shows that the indicator of average learning coefficient for test 2 after the experiment was higher than that of test 1 at the beginning of the experiment. The average learning coefficient grew by 1.32, while the average mark grew by 1.08. At the same time, the value of standard deviation at the end of the experiment decreased by 1.54. All this indicates that the increased competence and reduced gap between the maximum and minimum academic marks. Then we calculated the improvement coefficient, which characterizes the increase of student progress in percent. The improvement coefficient was 31.7% that was indicative of the increase of the level of development of professional competencies. Deferred testing or post-testing was carried out at the end of one year period following the experiment. The method of calculating key parameters did not differ, did not differ from the stated above for tests 1 and 2. So summary results of the deferred test are presented in table one. The average learning coefficient of the deferred testing was uh, 0.868, and the testing data of three tests are shown in bar graph four. So the average learning coefficient of test two was higher than the average learning coefficient of test two, three by 0.03. The analysis of the experiment in the objective aspect allows to draw the following conclusions. Using procedural technology of innovating autonomous language education based on negotiations leads to a quantitative increase in the learning coefficient that is expressed in knowledge improvement. Quantitative increase of the learning coefficient is stable, and the results of deferred testing confirm high level of development of professional competencies. This objective aspect is understood as student satisfaction with the educational process. To compare the efficiency of the offered procedural technique in the subjective aspect, we calculated satisfaction index using methodology devised by Nina Kuzmina. 
Using Cosminos technique, a questionnaire-based survey of students was carried out at the beginning and at the end of the experiment. It was aimed at revealing students' ulterior feelings towards the organization of education using procedural technology based on education. To determine those, we used three disconnected questions located on different pages of the questionnaire so the, so the respondents could not find out what they were relate, that they were related to one another. The attitude of students to the experiment can be ambiguous, so this technique allows to reveal the hidden position of questioned people, which they themselves might not be aware of. The three questions put together form the logical square. Figures in the grid of the square are estimates of the satisfaction scale and allow calculating the number of points gained by the results of questionnaire-based survey. Answers to points 3 and 4 of the scale were merged while calculating the obtained data. Various degree of satisfaction was given conditional num numerical values from plus 1 to minus 1. According to the results of the questionnaire-based survey at the beginning of the experiment, 37 students were completely satisfied with the procedural technology based on negotiation, 46 of them were more satisfied than dissatisfied, 28 were uncertain about their attitude, 14 were more dissatisfied than satisfied, and 7 students were completely dissatisfied. We calculated the satisfaction index, which according to the results was 0.35. The results of questionnaire-based survey at the end of the experiment made it clear that 101 students were completely satisfied with the procedural technology based on negotiations, uh, 28 students were more satisfied than dissatisfied, 3 students were, had uh, some uncertain attitude, 3 students more, were more dissatisfied than satisfied, and no students were completely dissatisfied. The satisfaction index at the end of the experiment was 0.87. The results of the questionnaire-based survey held at the beginning and at the end of the experiment are given in bar graph 5. Thus, the average value of satisfaction index at the beginning of the experiment had a positive but low value that indicated that the students were indifferent to procedural technology based on negotiations and were not satisfied with the organization of the educational process. At the end of the experiment, the satisfaction index was more than plus uh, 0.5, that is satisfaction. The analysis of test results and data obtained during the experiment and the questionnaire-based survey results confirmed the hypothesis that language education may be more effective if it gives every student an opportunity to develop an educational autonomy and to build an individual learning path, is pro process-focused and deploys procedural technology based on negotiation. There is no doubt about beneficial influence of decisions made by students in the process of education as they develop responsibility, give opportunities to use the received knowledge in self-directed education and, what is most important, have positive impact for their whole life. Advantages of negotiations used in classroom decision-making are the personal contribution of students to evaluation process can increase educational motivation. Negotiations can create the atmosphere of trust and mutual respect, which can hardly be reached by the teacher whose aim is to perform a certain role. Exchange and cooperation are cornerstones of modern society that can promote competitiveness of graduates. And the student who, negoti who negotiates becomes more independent and responsible, and probably these qualities will stay with him throughout life. Negotiations involve not only conversations directly about an object which is necessary to study, but also understanding and the use of the special skills necessary for processing and application of personal knowledge and abilities. And negotiations can take central place in groups with different levels. Though syllabus is usually approved by higher educational institution, teachers together with students can define the pace of work, tasks, type of their course, and to offer approaches to materials already available or to add materials of their own choice. In educational process, negotiations allow to start creation and implementation of the flexible, individualized learning paths corresponding their abilities, opportunities, motivation, and interests. A system of higher education that caters for individuality can guarantee high quality of education on the whole. Gracias. <laughs> Thank you.
The English teaching program would like to express their gratitude for, to Professor Privalova and all the presenters for their interesting topics. Now we'll have a plenary session in which our presenters will answer questions from the audience. We would also be very grateful if you could answer the uh, seminar evaluation form that will be handed out to you. Please, Professor Vulcano, Professor Baluyan, Professor Jaén, and Professor Privalova. people so if there are questions please ask them and speak louder and clear okay um, Alejandro has the microphone so if you need the microphone you can just ask for it hello uh, my question is uh, for Miss Vulcano Concerning the writing system, no, the writing process, is the um, establishment of due dates or um, how, how can I say the roadmaps? Yeah, is establishment of roadmaps a dangerous fact for the creative process? If I understood the question, are you talking about warm-ups? Are you talking about warm-ups? No, 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 no. I'm talking about road maps. Road maps. Would you mean the mind maps I mentioned? Huh? Are you referring to... I remember that I said something about mind maps. Is that what you mean? Se tiene que hacer una cosa... That's a road map. Road maps. Okay. To work in a mind map, for instance? If I want to work in a project and I want to advance, I need to uh, achieve goals. Mm -hmm. But if I put a date to what's, what I am doing, it's dangerous for the creative process. Deadlines. To submit deadlines. Who's the doctor? <laughs> ah, deadlines. I mean, deadlines. <laughs> I was talking about deadlines. Uh, you mean if if uh, there are deadlines for for each step in the process? Yeah, that should be. Yes. Um, um, okay. Perhaps we need to revise the process, right? The very first thing we said we do if we are uh, using the process is the um, stage in which we generate ideas. Yes, uh, that's something that many times can be done in collaboration, and that might take a period of class. Okay, that of course can be reviewed by yourself, by your peers outside the classroom, but that's something that can be done within a set time. Okay. Now, are you talking about the deadlines that you're given to improve a text? Is that what you mean? Because sometimes, yes, you might need more time. I talked about time constraints, unfortunately. I mean, many of the things that sometimes we say are a bit idealistic, okay? And I wish I could read five drafts from each student, but I can't. So, <laughs> we, um, so we start by producing the first, I mean you students produce a first draft that is given back to you um, to be reviewed 
with the help of uh, your peers, uh, with our own help, teachers, okay? Uh, you will reflect upon the comments that you were made on the organization of ideas, on the language itself, and that rush comes back to, te to the teacher, okay? Who reads it again, who sees if needs further improvement, and with those comments, you may write a second draft. And sometimes the second is the final draft, unfortunately. Would you say that you would need more time sometimes to um, improve a piece of work? Yeah. Yes, definitely. <laughs> but again, unfortunately, we all suffer from time constraints. And in writing matters, that's a problem we have, a big problem. Anybody else? Questions there? Introduce yourself first, okay? I forgot to tell you. Uh, hello, my name is Jaime Benavides. Uh, I teach the Developing English Course Intermediate here. Yeah, hello. <laughs> um, first of all, I thank you all for your presentations. Uh, I found lots of interesting things to to investigate. And I have two points. I liked uh, Miss Maria Moreno to expand on. First, um, you said that you have the answer to the question of what the difference is between a compound and a collocation. I'm pretty interested in that first. <laughs> if you can okay. enlighten us first, please. Okay. Um, I don't know if I have an answer for any for anything, maybe I was too fast in saying that. Um, but I tried to create a boundary between both concepts. And to me, the, um, the difference between a collocation and a compound is basically lexical and mainly semantic, in the sense that, to me, um, com um, a compound um, is a representation of an individual concept. All right. It's just one referent, one single semantic reference, whereas referent, whereas a collocation is always a combination of two different semantic reference. Is um, if you have um, an adjective plus a noun, you have two ideas combined. Whereas when you have a, a compound noun, for instance, or a compound adjective, uh, you have two words that have to come together to create one single idea, one single reference. So basically, um, we are moving in the semantic um, um, sphere, if you see what I mean. Is that, does it make any sense? Yeah, okay. I think I, I understand. I okay. don't know whether you, you do. Okay. I hope you do. And one other thing, um, basically you mentioned, uh, I just want to make this very fast, um, that we should encourage our students to, to pay attention to things, and therefore they, they will understand, especially what they focus on. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess you, you, you may think that um, we don't learn things that we don't pay attention to, right? We tell mm -hmm. them on the spot, mm -hmm. right? Yes, but well, mainly yes. Yeah, yeah. And also it seems to me that you appeal a lot to memory, right? So um, two questions concerning this. First. Um, do you know, or do you have any empirical information, empirical evidence, if, whether your students have, um, um, if they have kept the vocabulary they have learned in the long-term mm -hmm. memory? Mm -hmm. And one other thing, is there any place for context in your way of teaching here? Because um, it seems to me that, that you just teach chunks. It's what you said, right? And um, so they, they just memorize things, but where is like the um, the critical thinking we should develop in our students? Right? Is it just all about memory, or we should like give certain importance to the context in which we have to use the all the collocations we are learning in this case? All right. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thanks a lot for your very interesting questions. Um, 
As to the first one, um, I would really love to have that information, that evidence, empirical evidence, but I don't. I only, um, um, so far, I only had time to um, do the search for collocations, then to create the uh, teaching material, and then to put it into practice with this pre-test and post-test protocol, but only that. Um, so, of course, the, the next point or the next step would be to check whether there is actually long-term retention um, among my students. And I, and I didn't. I don't know whether they actually ended up forgetting all the collocations I taught them, or they actually remember something, or some of them, or most of them. I don't know. Um, you know, um, um, long-term uh, research is very difficult to to do, to conduct, because your students are your students this year, but next year they'll be different, and it's very difficult to keep, to keep a track of their progress. So I haven't um, done this, um, but um, this is this is something I would really love to do. Uh, and as to the second point, um, well, yes, I rely a lot on, on memorization, particularly for vocabulary teaching, because I think um, it is necessary to memorize vocabulary um, in order to improve your lexical competence. There's no way you can learn uh, vocabulary unless you actually start learning, acquiring, not learning, but acquiring the language from um, your very, very young age. And in an English speaking or in second language speaking environment, if you are in a non-native country and you only have four or five, even say, 10 hours a week of um, exposure to the language, there's no way you can learn it, you can acquire it without actually studying it, I think. And therefore, in terms of vocabulary, you really need to study it and you need to work on it um, from the memory point of view. So yes, I do believe in that. And um, um, I don't think um, my approach to teaching collocations or chunks of the language is, uh, is only decontextualized because of course they um, I focus on, on a list of collocations we come out of context but then the reason one of the reasons why I use concordances is to provide collocations in context which is as I as I mentioned in one of my slides is one of the main reasons or one of the main advantages um, in corpus based instruction that students find collocations in context, in real natural contexts, or right, in real texts. So um, they um, get access to the meaning of the collocations and also the pragmatic force and the pragmatic um, load of collocations because they are uh, within um, real um, context. So it's not only, and also um, you saw activities where they have to identify collocations from texts. So in that sense, they get um, the information or the items out of a context, and also not only from the input point of view, for, but also for their own output. In some of the activities, I ask them to create whole texts in which they have to use um, some of the collocations they need. Not the ones I've taught them, but the ones they need, which is um, what I mentioned before, my generative approach to language um, use, to productive language use. It's not just reproducing what you've been learning, but learning how to find new items that you need in context. So, of course, I, I do believe in learning vocabulary um, um, by heart, but also contextualized. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe everything is coming through here. I give it back to you. Uh, so, well, I I am a teacher in here. I teach a primary school context. So, uh, I am interested in relation to um, how you um, how you approach the teaching of of the collocation. So. Would you advise to present the topic, the topic collocation first, so then your your student can discover or be aware of them in in the situation, like in the in the corpus or in the text, because we we I, I am more uh, let's say I'm familiarized with the other way of going, like make them discover in the in the text like the pre while and post but not like making it too obvious like okay so this is a this is a collocation it's mainly this and that like an overt way of approaching it <laughs> so uh, 
I know that you are basing your, your approach mainly on pollination, but then uh, um, why did you decide to go that way? All right, there are th uh, two things, two different things um, here. Um, one is the difference between inductive and, and deductive teaching, which is, I think, what you mean. And um, when using a um, um, corpus-based approach to language teaching, not only collocations, but all kinds of teaching, you are definitely using an inductive approach, which is, I think, what I do. I mean, um, I am not giving students my list of frequent collocations first, and then I'm asking them to use them or to find them um, specifically in a text, I'm asking them, I'm giving them the material, and I'm asking them to find collocations in those um, readings or whatever. So I really think I'm using um, an inductive approach, and I think, I mean, beyond what I do or what I don't, what I think is more useful for collocation and for vocabulary learning, and in general for language learning, is an inductive approach, as long as your students can cope with it, all right, which is another issue. But um, that's on the one hand, I, I do believe in inductive teaching. Um, the second point you're making is my, um, my framework based on, um, on nation. And you said, well, you're explaining to your students what collocations are, you, you take that as your starting point, and once you've done that, you go and teach collocations. Well, my question would be, how else could I go about it? I mean. There's no way your students can learn collocations if they don't even know they exist. Because, as I said before, collocations are not as um, prominent and obvious um, for a non-native as an idiom. You don't need anybody to explain to you what an idiom is because you know it's something different, something that you need to work on, or a phrasal verb. You know, phrasal verbs are there, and even though nobody tells you what they are, and even though you don't know all the syntactic and grammatical aspects behind it, you pay attention to them, because they are difficult, they cause, us, they cause you uh, difficulty. Uh, but it's not the case with collocations, they go absolutely unnoticed. So, um, if you don't give the main idea, there's no way you can work on them. All right, that's my view. It will be like inductive but overt, <laughs> like the way of going in a in a way. Well, um, it would be um, inductive in the particular methodology, but uh, making first of all the point so that students know where they are going. Otherwise, I think students feel at a loss. I mean, you have this text. Look at the text. And do what if they don't know what even the colloc collocation is? There's no way they can work on it, I think. So I believe in constructivism, I believe in observation, self observation, your own thinking, everything, yes, but let's help students <laughs> somehow. And the last, just if, 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 miss. Miss. <laughs> I would say miss. Okay, so if later you could give us some references or authors that talk about uh, like uh, the emphasis on giving uh, the uh, let's say autonomy to students, like if you could give us some references. So, uh, yep, yeah. I base my research on the book that is called Classroom Decision Making by Michael Breen, and he uh, describes the negotiation process, and you can read about the stages it gives in detail and there are some descriptions of the practical use of this negotiation cycle and uh, it was issued approximately in 2000 okay. so uh, yeah so classroom decision making yeah by okay. michael breen thank you very much there is another question over here so she goes first and then the other side is breen e-r-e-e-m michael breen <laughs> Raise your hand. Hello, my name is Fabiola and I'm in first year of English pedagogy. And my question is directed to Svetlana Saluyan. Well, in your opinion, do you think the results of uh, today's language tests um, show reality of the students' knowledge and also do you think that maybe we need any other 
form or kind of testing to, are we missing some kind of testing to accomplish this, um, this, um, the, not this knowledge, but other people knowing what, what you know or not? You know, I have already mentioned that we'll have perfect tests when we can find the answer to the question, what does it mean to uh, know the language? Uh, we uh, don't know for sure yet. So the tests are not perfect now, of course. But somehow, um, I can say that um, it depends on the quality of the tests. You should um, uh, design the test according to the, all the rules. You should pre-test and do some analysis. You should um, find uh, the uh, validity, reliability of the test. And if you are sure that the test is quality one, you can use uh, in the classroom, and it will show uh, the knowledge of students uh, or, or uh, their practical skills, the level of their practical skills. And what was the second one? If you think that we need uh, to be tested, tested in any other oh, skill? Oh, yeah, another way. Yeah, thank you. You know, nowadays it's becoming more and more popular to test alternatively. We speak about alternative testing, such as portfolio testing, for example. And uh, you, the student can gather. Do, do you use this uh, sort of? Uh, well, in our country it's not common, that's why I say that it is new for us. We are testing uh, according to the old... Uh, no, uh, we, we use modern tests, we are developing testing speaking now, uh, because we have problems with this. Uh, testing writing is not so well developed, but what about receptive skills? We test them successfully with the help of the test. Alternative testing, such as portfolio testing, is something that is not common in Russia. That's why we say it. it's, it's something different. Which is better for you? Usual tests or alternative testing, like portfolio? What do you prefer? Hmm? <laughs> portfolio. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. So there's one question over there. Thank you. But there are the. Uh, well, I'm Maria Jose Gonzalez. I also teach here at the university. Um, and I have some questions for the four of you, if you can ask me, because it's something that I, I think all, every day, you know. And you mentioned, most of your presentations mentioned the idea of the communicative approach of communication, but at the same time, um, the idea of accuracy, right? Maybe in testing or in, in writing or even in collocations, right? So I would like to ask all of you, if you consider that the communicative approach is enough, or is it's how can I say it? It's it's. Um, I mean, if if you need that in order to know a language, which is something so abstract, right? It's it it can be fulfilled through the communicative approach. That's something that I would like to know. So we should start with uh, Patricia. <laughs> 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 Why do you say if it is enough? In what sense? Can you clarify? Because all of you mentioned, I mean, nowadays this is the trendy. Yes, we made an emphasis on Yes, it's like this is something that you have to achieve. You have to be communicative, right? But is that really to know a language? Or if you talk about syntax, you talk about grammar, you talk about accuracy. So in that, that sense, is really the communicative approach enough for achieving that, right? 
we're going to, I mean, all of us, we're teachers, or we're going to be teachers. Mm -hmm. So it's not the same to have a, a communicative approach if I'm going to use the language, if I'm going to teach the language, if I'm going to be um, a role model. That's my point. Well, in this case, uh, we are training future teachers. So uh, we are training them to uh, teach their students how to communicate in different skills. In this case, my, my field of language, which has to do really with writing, but also with, with oral skills. Uh, of course, I think that uh, it should be communicative. Um, when I, um, if you remember, when I, I was trying to explain, I was referring to communication as the um, putting ideas in a clear and fluent way, uh, I sort of presented a, a cake divided into two parts. And one uh, was aimed at mainly at content, at, at composing. Right? And the other was uh, the language itself, okay? In, which in, involved all these aspects that you mentioned. Uh, from syntax to, to um, mechanic to I mentioned so, so many things. I have my cake somewhere here. Okay, <laughs> let me see. Uh, so I think, yeah, I was. I I I mentioned I, I made a focus on composing, okay, where we included content on. In my case, because I was talking about writing, I made a point of the writing process on all, all the steps. Uh, but all that needs to be supported by the language, okay? So, in my field, the question could be, are we writing to learn or learning to write? What is the difference? Is that, do you see any difference? Do you think that we write to learn or we learn to write or both? Both. Both. Only that it is said that when, in my case, when you when we teach writing, uh, students should be learning to write. But at the same time, they are learning the linguistic system. So we kill two birds with one stone, I think. I don't know if I answered your question. I think sometimes communicative approach isn't enough for um, in some situations. For example, we are preparing future interpreters, translators, and I think in this case you can use even grammar translation method. It works in this case. It depends. It depends on, on the situation. Not always. Well, in my view, um, well, first. I think the question is very relevant and I want to thank you for that because I think that is really what we need to think about, what we're doing, where we're going and um, I think it's very interesting to have this kind of discussion. Um, I don't think we have the perfect method yet and what I don't know is whether it actually exists. Uh, I don't think there is such a thing as a perfect method and actually you know that as a reaction to communicative language teaching which seemed to be still focused on the products, we moved to the task-based approach, which is now seem to focus in on the process. And now we're starting to realize that the task-based approach is also a failure, because you cannot actually learn without some focus on form. Um, so we're starting to have this no method approach that they are um, talking about now. So I think we are now getting to the middle of nowhere. So I think that's why I think it's, um, that's why I think it's so important to have these kind of discussions. The problem is to me that we are moving between the extremes. I mean, um, and, that sometimes, and also the second problem is that we confuse and that we mix up things. One thing is your approach, your philosophy as to what a method is, which is what language is and what learning is. And that is different from the specific activities, the techniques that you use in the classroom. I mean, teaching grammar and teaching translation does not mean that you are following the grammar translation method. You may have a more modern approach or communicative approach and still find some use for translation. So I think we need to go beyond um, these ideas. And also the thing is that um, I think we come from a misconception of um, communicative language teaching, communication, is not only fluency. Communication is also accuracy. So 
you said, um, you all talk about um, accuracy, but then you all talk about communication. So, um, do you think communication, communicative language teaching is not enough? Well, I think within communication, we should include accuracy. And if you include accuracy, and if you find the way in between, focus on functions and meaning, but also focus on form, then um, we are on the right track. That's my, my opinion. and their attitude to the communicative approach and I think that if we one day decide that something is enough, our civilization and our world is going to die out. Yeah? I think that it's in the nature of people to um, desire more and more. So, but it's also in the nature of people to rush when something new appears. So when we have some new technology that's being created, we think that we should forget about the previous developments and rush into it. But then in some time we realize that uh, nothing is perfect in our world and we have to design and create something else. I think that uh, uh, communicative approach, first of all, now at this stage should be blended with the previous approaches, but it's not the end, and it's going to be the continuation, yeah. Thank you. All right, so we don't have more time for more questions, but if you have more questions, you can email them, okay? Right? Um, all right, so thank you very much for coming today. We hope we have a, a, another type of these seminars next year. And now we'll um, give some presents to our speakers. Um, so just give me a minute. wants me to explain the presence. Okay, so these two, they're like shawls, are made of um, alpaca wool, and these ones are of, uh, made of uh, sheep, wool of sheep. Russian spoon that is uh, decorated in the form of Hachlama. It's called Hachlama and it should have uh, gold, uh, red and black colors. And we saw one yesterday in the, in the house of uh, Pavla Neruda. Yeah, so if you go there you will see about four of them. And inside is the book about Technorog. It's the place we come from and it's both in Russian and in English. So anybody who desires to study Russian can do it with the help of this book. Thank you very much. Okay, 
people. Thank you very much for coming. Remember to come to the first workshop at 2.30 at the computer lab, okay?